Coming up on Gamers Week Podcast. Let's start off with Lego and Nintendo have unveiled the Legend of Zelda Great Deco Tree 2-in-1 set, which launches September 1st, 2024, priced at $299. Box includes four Lego minifigurines with Breath of the Wild Princess Zelda and Link dressed in their recognizable blue attire and Ocarina of Time, including both Young Link and Link. Hey. See, one of the great <laughs> features about this set that they haven't mentioned is that the weapons for the Breath of the Wild characters, they actually break if you play oh, with them I too much. Oh. <laughs> I caught the last episode. No. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I was there and I didn't expect it. So <laughs> uh, You're welcome. You're welcome. Oh. So I've been trying this Arizona hard peach tea thing. Not good. <laughs> oh, really? And not even a little good. It's like two drinks in one can. It's very strange. It's like first you get the super artificial peach flavor. And then underneath is like whatever cheap watered down like rubbing alcohol they use to get it up to 5%. <laughs> they need to do something with all that extra hand sanitizer. So just <laughs> <laughs> You know, that could totally be it. It's a very accurate assessment of the taste. It's, yeah, not good. Yeah, I remember they tried one summer to make the hard root beer thing and it just, no? unless one of you like it, but up here it just, it did not I don't recall like that being a thing. It was very short-lived. <laughs> it, <didn't... laughs> it doesn't sound like it would be bad if it was done okay. Yeah, I mean root beer, root beer floats, root beer mm -hmm. candy. Like it's got it's got a mix, but somehow just something about trying to make it alcoholic just did not pass the smell test. So mm. it came and went. We barely knew ye. <laughs> <laughs> R.I.P. I'll pour out this Arizona hard spiked tea in remembrance. <laughs> all ready when you guys are i am ready to go all set all right just give me one moment here you just said you were all ready to go well i've got i mean i am emotionally ready hmm. mm. <laughs> the most important ready exactly thank you thank you Trey. so we're waiting on spiritually or uh technologically <laughs> <laughs> metaphysically <laughs> All right, so I need everyone to be quiet so I can go live with this one. All right, here we go. I don't like you. I don't like you at all. I know. All right, everybody. Welcome to Gamers Week Podcast. Like the name says, we analyze the best, the worst, and the weirdest headlines of the past week in the video game industry. This is episode 119. Today is Wednesday, May 29th, 2024. My name is Ryan, and I will be your host for this evening. But as you can see on your screen, or if you're listening at home, I am not alone. And I have with me a woman who likes to remind me daily just in case i forgot that i am indeed a bad person blue williams blue how you doing today do you finally have it like hammered into your skull that you're a bad person no i, th I think a few more reminders you know maybe just like a planned set each day you know uh, kind of keep me on my toes you know what i am willing to do that for you <laughs> <laughs> i'm a bad person and you're a good friend yep <laughs> I think it's a good pairing. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you guys can see, or if you're listening in, uh, Donnie is unfortunately recovering from a freak Brazilian wax accident. Uh, so mm. he will not be joining us for this evening, but we do wish him a speedy and lotion covered recovery. Don't forget that ice, Donnie. <laughs> <laughs> But we have with us a special guest today, Trevor, from the New Dad Gaming Podcast. So, Trevor, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to the show? Yeah, absolutely. And thankfully, my Brazilian wax went great, and that's why I was able to show up so quickly. So, the, we're really happy to be here. <laughs> Must have different folks. Yeah, so, <laughs> pleasure to be here, guys. Thanks so much. Yeah, as mentioned, Trevor from the New Dad Gaming Podcast, a uh, 
gaming podcast for dads trying to figure out uh, fatherhood gaming and their gaming lives as fathers. Love that. And actually, you were on episode number five, if I remember that right. That's right. I, I did. I did have the great pleasure of being here before once and uh, mm-hmm. only took uh, 100 and uh, <laughs> 14, <laughs> 14 years as a father way back here. But <laughs> no, but you absolutely. Were- you were Absolute our very guest on the show, so right. it was, you set a high bar for everyone to follow. Yeah. And- <laughs> very nice. Yeah, no, I had an absolute blast, and of course, a big fan of the show, so so wonderful to be here tonight with you both. Love it, and thank you so much for coming back. We, we really appreciate it, man. Yeah, what's going on in your show? You guys have like several hundred more episodes than we do. You're <laughs> yeah. on episode 327 right now? Yeah, the funny, the funny, the numbers don't quite work because we've had a few parental like hiatuses from here and there but it generally started with my first kid who's just turning nine so wow. jeff and i've been at this for like nine years with that show <sighs> Holy yeah shit. yeah <laughs> <laughs> but what's been fun is like so before it was the trials and tribulations when we started of infants and oh my god i'm tired all the time i have no time for games transition slowly into hey they played their first game oh my god they love mario kart this is amazing life's great now, his are starting to get into the teens, so gaming laptops, Roblox, Minecraft, mm. and Fortnite, and not wanting to play with their old dad anymore. Mine are <laughs> starting to, yeah. <laughs> so, it, what, what has been the funnest thing about the show is generally it's a catalog of which you can look back on of all the gaming memories between fathers and kids as they kind of go up into it, so... That's if anything that that's the secret of why it's lasted so long. Because if if nothing else, it's basically just a diary at which the end of it's like, hey, here's like twenty years of how you grew up around gaming. I love that. That's so I cool. do love that. At some point, hopefully in the future, they'll go back and be able to listen and have such amazing <laughs> memories, and hopefully a, a a few cringe moments will be good for oh them. Lord. But <laughs> I, I think that hit that probably hit when they were like, uh, he was like four or five. I'm like, huh. He's going to be able to listen to this. And it's not all <laughs> flattering. It's just because some like, you just, you don't, you don't strangle your kids, but you, you understand why people do. It's crazy. <laughs> they're, they're just some nights, right? So they're going to be able to go back and uh, catalog and hold that against me, but it'll right. all be worth it. Love it. Yeah. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us, Trevor. So uh, why don't we go ahead and jump into our reviews, reactions, and requests for this week. So first up is from Arcade Main. It's a, he said, the gimmick of In Your House was wild because it was basically these are lesser PB- PPVs. We are still going to charge you too much money for, though they were, there were some great matches. They all had the facade of a house, but also at the start off, they actually did not give away a house so they did give away a house oh they did i'm sorry they actually did give away a house there we go next up from retro gaming dev it says being over encumbered has one of the most annoying mechanics of all time games like fallout for example turn into inventory management simulators every 15 minutes maybe i shouldn't pick everything up (laughs) (laughs) you need that weird plate though you need it every time that's like that is the first cheat the first mod on every fallout game i ever do like Carry weight, two million. Just, I got, <laughs> got no time for that. Yeah. And last up from Gaming Gain said, I told my wife many times that when I die, all of my gaming crap will be hers. She's not terribly <laughs> excited. <laughs> Maybe if you didn't describe it as gaming crap, you got to sell it. It's, it's right. This treasure. is a marketing thing, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. This will absolutely look. I, I told you the NES cartridges are going to be bank one day. Like it all go into your hands. Just. Take it to a vendor. You'll know what to do. You'll be set for life. Right. All those Facebook articles that are like, you've got a six figures worth of old games in your attic and you don't even know. <laughs> What's the old well, adage? Like, I'm afraid that my wife will sell my collection for what I told her I paid for it. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> no, no, it's, it, it's an investment, darling. It's for the kids' education, I swear. It'll, <laughs> it'll only go... This, these Xbox 360s, they'll never go out of style, I swear. <laughs> right. In the 90s, people hoarded Pokemon, or not Pokemon, um, Beanie, Beanie Babies. Babies. And uh, now it's 360 games. If you could imagine like a massive box of Pokemon card mm-hmm. that you like, when, when they first started to come out, that you would hoard it. And like the guff that you would have received from anybody you knew oh yeah and then and then this year to 2024 you pull out that box and just king amongst men like millionaire <laughs> <Right>. immediately 
<laughs> who would have ever thought of it? So, right, in, invite them on your uh, cruise with you, just yeah. because you're generous and a good. As friend. a flex as well, just mm, oh yeah, <laughs> yep. <laughs> Pokemon cards were stupid, huh? <laughs> <laughs> 30 years, look who's laughing now. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so why don't we go ahead and shout out our patrons? We couldn't do what we do without the help of our gorgeous patrons. Here are the generous folks supporting Gamers Week on Patreon. And we have a new patron to announce. A big thank you and welcome to A Gill 2020. They'll be joining Ducks in Disguise. Don't make me pull over this car. Sir Coffee of House Blend, first of his name. Hybrid Divide, Matto 1606, You Fall Before Me, Davey PGH, The Red Ox, BDX Family, including Shannon and Luke, Zach Huge Thanks, Number One Blue Sick Voice Fan, John Baron, Sassy Sony, Evo Lust, Rai Rai's Secret Best Friend, Mega Retro Man, Gamma Troid, Mora Deeb, Michael Lekite, Emo Esque, Bill Tucker, The Real Retro Game Brews, Fruitcakes Pickled Pepper, Ducks with Thick Thighs, Wizard of Zardoz, Bob's and Dugnut, Loud Moth, Retro Blast Pat, Great Cyaman, 81, BT Zilla Guy, the Mad Milk Band, Seven Castle Forest, Crunchy Kong, Sheriff Snacks, Frank Grande, Love Retro BTW, Steven Sand, Ramboski, Terry Kinnair, and Doongie Forever. If you like what you hear today, and we really hope you do, please consider joining us on Patreon. Your support helps cover the cost of producing the show, as well as other cool stuff we'll be doing, like prizes and giveaways. You'll also gain access to our bi-weekly patron-only bonus cast called Gamers Week Uncut, Patrons with Benefits. Visit patreon.com slash gamersweek or follow the link in the show notes to learn more. Do the ducks ever fight? <laughs> no, <laughs> now that you mention that, that would be fantastic. That would be. That's and Dex, Dex in Disguise sometimes does the streams where he has the peeps joust yes. in the microwave. So I think that when they do battle, it should be similar to that. <laughs> Because it feels like there should only be one duck at a time. And it's almost like monthly. You need to have the ducks just like battle it out in some sort of online forum to mm-hmm. see who gets to be duck for the month at very least. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to amend the reading. Duck of the month this month is. <laughs> you know what's going to happen, though, is everyone's going to change their Patreon name to be duck related in some way. Right? <laughs> that's per- that- See, that's how you get a good pecking order. Ah, uh, well done. Well done. Well <laughs> done. <laughs> Sorry, that's a dad joke. What do you want? <laughs> it's on brand. I like it. I like you get, it. You get one. You get one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So why don't we go ahead and jump into our headlines? Absolutely. So the headline segment is sponsored by Retro Game Club Podcast. It's a fantastic, family-friendly retro gaming podcast. In each episode, Rob and Hugh pick two games to play and discuss, as well as news, interviews, and other topics. Right now, they're doing a deep dive of Sega Gameworks launch party that aired on MTV from 1997. Visit them at RetroGameClub.net or follow the link in the show notes. There's a lot of 90s words. (laughs) <laughs> and that's that's right there. The MTV, Sega yeah. GameWorks launch party, MTV, nineteen ninety seven. Yeah, what point do you say those three letters and they, someone just stares back at you like, that's <laughs> is that a text thing? Like, what is that? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> those three letters mean exactly. It's, I can't imagine. Like, what what's the age right now? Do you think who? What age would you ask somebody and they would not understand what MTV oh, is? Yeah, um, but MTV is still a thing today isn't it i mean technically technically, it technically? do they have they don't have a cha- do they have a channel like what are they they still have a channel they gotta have still have a channel right so, so trying to I have to think anybody over 30 probably gets it yeah i'll mm-hmm. give you that 25 yeah. and on un- 20 and under for sure no and that's just where <laughs> it's gonna be one of those divides where like you gotta what what starts to go the ether like we'll be we as we age it's just more and more of those things like start to go into that mm-hmm. category of like you know, like MTV. Oh, no, you don't right. know. You don't know. Oh, no. And then it's that gif from Saving Private Ryan. So I Googled yeah, it real fast. <laughs> and uh, there's a TV schedule link. There's a link to Pluto TV where I guess it's on. So it does technically still have a channel. And then mm-hmm. there's a live TV link, but you have to sign in, which makes me yeah. suspect it's streaming and you have to pay for it. Cool. Uh, but to uh, main ace Chase's point, uh, since 2001, it hasn't really been music TV, just been 
crappy reality TV shows. So Yeah. And uh, RGC Zach says, I can tell you my 10 year old has no idea what the fuck <laughs> MTV is. I think that's a parenting issue, Zach, honestly. Yeah. Every parent has priorities. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> <laughs> All right. So why don't we jump into our quick takes and let's start off with Lego and Nintendo have unveiled the Legend of Zelda Great Deco Tree two in one set, which launches September 1st, 2024, priced at $299. Box includes four Lego mini figurines with Breath of the Wild Princess Zelda and Link dressed in their recognizable blue attire and Ocarina of Time, including both Young Link and Link. There are also buildable characters and creatures such as Hetu, the Korok complete with his maracas, several smaller Koroks, Deku Papas, Navi the Fairy, who everybody hates, the Deku Sprout, <laughs> and Skulltula, which I always have a hard time pronouncing. Uh, <laughs> See, one of the great features about this set that they haven't mentioned is that the weapons for the Breath of the Wild characters, they actually break if you play oh, with them I too much. I caught the last episode. No. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I was there and I didn't expect it. So <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Oh. How do you guys feel? Like, would, is this something you'd want to buy? Is this kind of way too much, too pricey for a nostalgia type of gag? Like, Where, where do you kind of fall on this one? Yeah, Legos long time ago became a thing that I'm like, I can't freaking afford these. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, that that is steep. Like, I... It's a, it seems great. Like that, especially uh, Ocarina of Time, like that blocky nature from back on the 64 to a Lego, like 100% that makes sense. Oh, yeah. What I'd almost expect this to be is, were you guys familiar with the Mario and Lego uh, pair up that they did, especially like the interactive pieces? Yeah, the, mm-hmm. the one that's like a TV right? and, and yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. the one where it's actually the uh, like it, Mario is a little scanner and he jumps on different things mm-hmm. and as like you collect coins as you're so you can build your own Mario world with like Legos and stuff. Mm-hmm. So it's like this 3D interactive things and I can say like my kids were just adored it. That thing was fantastic. So it almost seems like a lost opportunity where for that kind of price, as opposed to just this mantelpiece where you build it once and stare at it and not let anyone touch it because you right. took twelve hours to build it. Like this interactive one, like because Zelda's a very kid friendly, fun, oh, yeah. like very much a live type of platform. So it almost seems like a for that kind of money, perhaps a bit of a waste of uh, opportunity for what could have been a really fun type of Lego integration. And I'd agree. I mean, at three hundred dollars, let's be honest, that prices that out for most kids. I mean, yeah. think about it as a you know a mom or dad, you're looking at three hundred dollars, and you're you're going to spend that on an entire console. At some point, I mean, the switch itself <laughs> is two hundred and ninety nine dollars, but you're going to take, like you said, uh, grab something that takes twelve hours to build, have it sit on a shelf, and uh, just look pretty. Which says to me that maybe this target market for this is not necessarily hmm. kids. <laughs> you did say the collector market, right? That wants <laughs> two copies of this. They're going to spend six hundred bucks. One's going to sit on a shelf and never be touched, and the other mm-hmm. one is going to be built also never touched after that and it's going to be pristine and the box is still going to be okay no trevor you're buying a 300 dollars lego set for your nine-year-old right no no <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm more of like the buy well i'll buy two used switch lights and like have a have a there good go. time instead <laughs> mm-hmm. as opposed to something like this it right. it certainly is a trend if you guys have been to one of the lego stores recently there's now basically they've kind of just given up the pretense Oh, but there's okay. now an entire section that's basically just okay, adults. Like away you go. <laughs> and they're all they're all done like in black boxes. It's things like um, Van Gogh's uh, famous portrait. It's like the way there's all these like type of other things you can build out. Hmm. So they're just starting to kind of give away the pretext of like maybe your kids could play with it. Like, yeah, nah. not at that price. They're not. Like, <laughs> they're getting the ten dollar Duplo and while well, mommy go. and daddy go and put them together. <laughs> like, this massive piece. You know, I, I I would love if they sold just like the individual pieces for all the characters there. And so mm. you didn't have to buy the whole set. I mean, you, sure, you, you have to pay 10 bucks for each character, but you wouldn't be spending $300 for the whole set. And you could play with it with those characters in other Lego wor- worlds that you build and still have that like, you know, Zelda experience. But then so again, then they're just amiibos. Yes. 
<laughs> Amiibos that stick, though. They stick into the, the <laughs> slots, right? And you can slightly right. pose them. Exactly. Totally there different. There you go. Totally, completely different. <laughs> I'm still just sad about the breaking weapon comment. That was like, that hurts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So next up from Amazon Games announced today that it has struck a deal with Maverick Games for a narrative led open world driving game, which is set to release on PC, PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X and S. Build as a AAA project, the untitled game may be more story driven than Forza Horizon Games. It leads its lead writer is James Britton, who includes the British teen drama skins or whose work rather includes the british team strong drama that's a that's a word yeah. <laughs> british teen <laughs> drama skins there we go we got it out there it is so i know i know what you all want from your driving games you want more <laughs> underage kids doing things <laughs> british british kids british that's right. kids, you're right <laughs> right they sound so, more grown up with the accents <laughs> Just like a crappy remake of Herbie. <laughs> thing, there was. A, did you guys ever play the Need for Speed? There was one Need for Speed that was super story driven. It might have even had the guy from uh, Breaking Bad as like one of the lead characters. Like you, does that Heisenberg? Ring any bells? <laughs> no, the other one. Oh, okay. <laughs> that would have been a bit much. Right. So the story was like the you're doing all these races, but the the main thread that was pulling you through was that you were a racer, your brother was a racer, your brother was killed in a mob hit, now you're going deep undercover to try to yeah. undercover to find his death. And that was the main... So it was all the bombastic nonsense of a big racing game, but that if you did the story missions, it was that one true, like, through line of a story to kind of, like, pull you through to get it. I, I, now, you know, I, I can't speak for the credits. I liked it. Like, it was kind of, like, interesting and fun. Mm-hmm. And it also comes at a time when, like, have you seen some of the new, like, survival driving games that have come out recently? Survival driving games. There was that one that was set in the Pacific Northwest. Is that exactly. kind of, that's yep. what, what you're talking about? Yep. So there's Pacific, there's one called Heading Out, uh, which is mm -hmm. similar to the one you're talking about is Pacific Drive. Mm. And, and I think there's even another one. So like, you were right on point. Uh, so it, it just seems like there's a whole kind of mini genre. Of, and then, so, so sometimes you wonder, okay, what is this about? Is this, did Amazon put their finger to the wind and it's like, hey, driving game with stories. Yeah, like, all right, triple A, like get the British guy. Let's go. Let's make a game about it. Throw money at it. Throw money. <laughs> <laughs> or was it just like happenstance? But, uh -huh. you know, so th there's the entire gamut, what they could do. It could either be a need for speed remake where it's just like, there's kind of a story in a fun racing game, or it's mm -hmm. like a survival horror set amongst driving. Not sure where they would land. See, I played a lot of Need for Speed like back on PS2 and then I mm. kind of got away from it. So I'm not familiar with which game you're talking about. In the chat, they're like, uh, Games with Coffee and Gamer looks at 40. They're saying that's the Need for Speed movie with Aaron Paul has that uh, plot line, which I, I did see that. I did see that movie. That was not great. <laughs> it was a movie. It was a movie. I had to clear my good name. So <laughs> make sure I didn't just have a fever if you, dream. <laughs> if you said it was a game, I believe you, Trevor. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, definitely, damn it. They're definitely... Okay, so he was not the character in it. In my mind, I did merge the two. So the movie had him from Breaking uh -huh. Bad. But I swear to God, there was a game. Because <laughs> usually guys, the... Uh, the Need for Speed games were just, they all had the same plot as like, you're a, you're a street racer, but you've been disgraced somehow. And now you've got to, to beat other racers and get your, your street cred back. Need for Speed Payback Revenge? Maybe. Hey, look it up, kids. I swear to God it exists, but they. <laughs> <laughs> Do your own research. <laughs> Do your own, just Google it. God. Yep. <laughs> anyway, I'm not. Uh, opposed to a game like this, depending on how they do it. I do like racing games. Uh, of course, if it's open world and all that, you kind of wonder about is there, how much is single player and how much is forced to be online and multiplayer and mm. what do the season pass statistics look like and all that kind of stuff. But For myself, I'm kind of curious to see what they would do with it. And it's the fact that it's coming from Amazon. Well, there's two surprising things. First, it's coming from Amazon. Okay, new player in the game trying to... Mm -hmm. No, they have such a, a great history of actually <laughs> following through on their AAA releases that they say they're going to do. I didn't detect any sarcasm in that sentence. <laughs> 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 uh, 
But then the fact they're actually bringing you to Xbox and play just to everywhere as well, as right. opposed to just PC on their own Amazon platform. Or Luna. <laughs> yeah, Luna, yes. their platform, yeah. Because they actually want people to play it. So. <laughs> you don't have a Luna controller? especially with you. <laughs> you know, I meant to order one and I just keep forgetting. It's in your car, you know? <laughs> right. I'll, I'll actually click order one of these days, but it's definitely in the cart. Well, I think if you keep saying enough while streaming on Twitch, one will just show up eventually. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up is Atari announced that it had acquired the Intellivision brand and certain games from Intellivision Entertainment LLC. The deal will not, however, include the Amico. Instead, Intellivision Entertainment will continue as a separate rebranded company and will continue working on the Amiga, using a license from Atari to release Intellivision games on it. The Intellivision intelligent television console was released by mattel in 1979 and was responsible for starting the first ever video game console war going head to head against the atari vcs later renamed the atari 2600 uniting atari and a television after 45 years ends the longest running console war in history said mike mika studio head at atari owned digital eclipse the sentence kind of feels like a bit of wish fulfillment to where it's like, you know, Atari, a very powerful, relevant company, the television, <laughs> still a very powerful, relevant company coming together <laughs> really makes a great company. Am I right, guys? People are like, yeah, sure. <laughs> it's like the geezers at the nursing home are like losing their minds and everybody's like, okay, grandpa, let's go back yeah, they're to like, go home. <laughs> yep. They're, they're all just hugging. There's this great peace from people who still remember. It's like, it's like oh, good. The war is over, guys. We, we can finally get along we made it <laughs> thanks mike mika <laughs> yep. all right next up rolling stone has returned to games media by launching a new section rolling stone gaming as reported by game developer the section will be headed by senior gaming editor christopher cruz who's previously an executive producer on the site's content studio which included its daily show rolling stone on twitch this isn't the first time that rolling stone has covered gaming back in 2016 it launched its gaming vertical blixel am i saying that right <laughs> with industry veteran john davidson as the site's general manager a year later glixel san francisco office was shut down and all of its staff were laid off yeah. Speaking of companies I haven't thought of since the nineties, <laughs> just are you not, are you either in games journalism? I thought like one. Do not do you either? Was, do not yeah. write for like uh, yeah. I, I was and then uh, made a swift exit because it got okay. terrible. Because <laughs> to that end, I'd almost be most curious about your opinions of a former editorial type of rag that was out there doing a bunch of work then they laid off everybody now they come back and it's like hey we're here again we're gonna do it yeah is it, is it like too much too late like how, how does that how does this strike you as someone who's had some experience in games media yeah it, it definitely strikes me as being late to the party hmm. when you look at gaming from the outside it there's so much revenue billions and billions of dollars of worldwide revenue in gaming and yet making money with games media games journalism is really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we, we've talked about this on the show before, but like just last week or the week before you saw IGN buying out other gaming outlets with the assumption being that with these redundancies now in their portfolio, they're just going to close their competitive competitor outlets. And they're trying to make a go of it and doing like a, a big showcase this summer or whatever. But the point being that most outlets that have gaming journalism – as one of their their beats have either scaled back drastically they don't really cover news anymore they do walkthroughs or you know mm. kind of evergreen content that gets ads forever because of course everything is ads driven yeah whereas people are stuck trying to get their actual news mainly from like YouTubers and things like that. So it's strange to me that Rolling Stone is showing up as the party is ending. Like there's <laughs> the red solo cups are all over the ground. There's no more <laughs> chips, you know, somebody's throwing up in the pool and Rolling Stone shows up like, Hey, we're here. Where's the party? <laughs> we're going to be the next ninja on Twitch. Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> It's a little bit like a hey fellow kids kind of moment, but you know, good luck to them. Hopefully, they won't just lay everybody off a year's time. Yeah, I wonder too. Like, I mean, you guys are creators and you're on here, and there's something that, for me that always seems so call it disingenuous, but it's 
a bunch of creators are creating excellent content on YouTube, on Twitch. They're out there grinding away, trying to do some big work. And then they start to make a name and they start to do well. And that's awesome. Good. Like content creators making a living. This is awesome. Right. And then these kind of crusty old big names, <laughs> just like, and I'll say like, I even have some like, I have some like trepidation with like some actors. Cause in some way too, it's like, it's cool that you want to do this, but it kind of sucks because you have, you're sucking up all the oxygen in a way. Right. Right. Where it's just like these people have been grinding away forever. And so the, to have like these big names try to show up into these spaces where other people have been trying for so long to make something is, especially like when, like you said, they, they've showed up so late to the party after having blown it before. Right. And now that it's open arms, like, like what would they expect for the, their reception on this entire thing? Not sure yeah. how you feel about their kind of crashing that party either. Well, and everybody wants that demographic that like, 18 mm. to 35 demographic and i'm not sure how much the name recognition of rolling stone really means <laughs> to that age MTV. group <laughs> MTV. <laughs> so uh uh yeah i think they've got an uphill climb ahead of them and uh, we'll see how it goes it's gonna bring them onto your uh, podcast next time from rolling stone is uh <laughs> well hey uh john davidson and christopher cruz if you guys are available there you go <laughs> Come on the show. Come on the show. After we crapped all over you. <laughs> constructive criticism. Oh, constructive sorry, sorry. criticism. So feel free to edit out that last comment. Though. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And last stop, Google has started rolling out its playables feature on YouTube. An in-app arcade is available to play on desktop, iOS, and Android, featuring over 75 games, including Angry Birds Showdown, Word of Wonders, and Cut the Rope. Playables is still unavailable to some users, with Google saying in a blog post that it's widening availability over the coming months. YouTube began testing its playables feature last September to a limited number of people. Speaking of a company like Amazon trying to get into the gaming market. Yeah. Google's like, play your old classics. Everything that you've ever seen before. We knew you I were going to go on YouTube, so. Yeah. I mean, t like 10 years ago, I played Cut the Road for a hot minute. I really liked it. But, I mean, the mm. point is you can play it many places and do not need it from freaking YouTube and their app. Mm. I wonder if that's like the, how much would you attribute to this with the, challenges that consoles are facing because i do think about i, I think about Am amazon's rushing in they're going to flood mm -hmm. the market twitch has amazing if you have prime the games are throwing out on a weekly basis it's crazy right netflix and net netflix's games on ios are fantastic like i just discovered that they had hades mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. a release on ios so if you have netflix you can just get hades on your ios de device for free which is wild and then now YouTube starting to like kind of circle their wagons too. It's like, oh, we're also going to rush, like bum rush this market. We try to give away games to people who are already mm -hmm. on our services. And then you have these old stalwarts of the consoles are like, please buy our big machines <laughs> <laughs> and like $90 games. Like, please right. keep it in. It it just makes for like to hear that YouTube is going in in such a big way after Amazon, after YouTube, after game. But like it's, it makes for a wild time in this market. No. I think you're you're actually nailing it on the head as to I, what their strategy is. Uh, if you mm. look at Amazon and Google, they have these massive server networks that have cloud computing on it, right? Uh, and they are set up essentially to be probably the best, most we'll say secure way for cloud gaming to exist in the future. They already have the infrastructure to do it, more or less. Mm. Uh, so with the whole idea of buy our big machine, right, that, that costs $500 to get access to, uh, when that, I think, and this is my prediction for the future, when that stops being so popular, when the, the generation of kids that are, are alive today just don't see the need to have that big machine at home, Google and Amazon are going to be there. And so what I think mm. they're trying to do is position themselves in the market by saying, hey, we already did games. So once we start releasing all these big AAA titles, Netflix included in on that, um, it's not going to be surprising as much as it is right now. Hmm. And when he said they're going to be there for some reason, that immediately thought about the scene of the movie where the guy's holding the stereo outside the window. <laughs> so, it's like, so someone's inside crying, like, I don't have any games. Sitting with the stereo. We're here, I swear. <laughs> but, so Jeff, like my co-host, he's super adamant about physical 
versions oh, yeah. of games. Yeah. Because he, he's terrified of it. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. this it seems to almost be another death knell and the idea of owning a physical copy yep. of a game. Because ultimately, like, you, you're you on YouTube, you're just playing this thing for free. Like, there is not only is it um, not physical as in something that you own, but you're not even paying a subscription to get access to it. It's just on, nascently on something that you happen to be on right. already. And in a time of, like, I love your conversation on the last show where you're talking about um, leaving games... To, as a will to like get right. to your, next your Twitch of kin. library. Yeah, yeah. 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 The the thought that now like what is a game what is owning a game? And, and and if this is how it happens where it's just floating games are free floating across three or four services you happen to be on anyways, like what the heck is owning a game going forward? It's a little bit like uh bequeathing your D V D collection. She corrected herself. She corrected. <laughs> she saved the podcast's good name. You're welcome. You're welcome. By saying the queen like rather than the We know what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Games for Coffee, for pointing out our bad vocabulary last week. <laughs> All right. I'm trying to get past it. I can't. It's good. <laughs> 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 I mean, it's not that big of a stretch. You're promised mm. to a person, right? Mm. So you're just promising your game collection to a person, yeah. right? It's like, I promised my high score on my last YouTube session <laughs> upon my kids. <laughs> just doesn't right? have the same ring to it as here's my old Atari, my old shoebox full of Atari games. <laughs> well, uh, the future sucks. <laughs> We're in the worst time. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's enough nihilism for today. (laughs) Is it though? Is it? I'm sure it will return. So for our first full headline this week, we've got from GameSpot, PlayStation exec believes game developers will prioritize immersive narratives over ever improving graphics in the future. The man who heads PlayStation Productions and product at PlayStation Studios believes that the future of gaming will be about immersive narratives. Sony posted an interview with Asad Kisselbosch that discussed how the video game medium might change over the next 10 years. For creators, the PlayStation executive believes they'll be able to just create so much more emotion in the stories. The focus is going to shift from graphics or visuals to immersive narratives that resonate long after the controller is set down. Kisselbosch is also bullish on AI and how that will affect the medium going forward. Advancements in AI will create more personalized experiences and meaningful stories for consumers, he said. For instance, NPCs in games could interact with players based on their actions, making it feel more personal. I think we are getting to the point in which graphics, the improvement of graphics is diminishing returns. As far as things go, the graphics are getting to the point where they're just very realistic, at least realistic enough that it's visually stunning to to play games nowadays, right? And Mm. you can create all these insane different worlds and narratives utilizing those graphics. Uh, So it it really comes down to art style and what you choose to do with it. Uh, so if, if we're constantly looking for that next upgrade to graphics, it's it's not the same upgrade from the Atari to the NES, NES to Super Nintendo, Super Nintendo, and so on. The amount that you can improve upon that is going to be so minuscule. Uh, I don't blame developers for focusing less on graphics. I think we're at that kind mm-hmm. of that peak point. And as far as making more immersive narratives, that seems to match with what I would want as a gamer. Uh especially somebody who is into retro games for the most part. (laughs) Graphics aren't really something where I I need uh, for myself, but those narratives and having a story-driven game is going to allow me to experience and really put myself in the character's shoes or put myself in the the world in which you're interacting with. And I love the, the idea of NPCs being able to interact with them and that they change based off of how you interact with them, making them seem more realistic as far as the story is concerned. It becomes that like choose your own adventure. I don't know if you guys remember those books back in the day, but it was like, oh, yeah. if you want to do this mm-hmm. or you want to do that, flip to page this or that. And those those books were super cool. I liked that that concept. I also always just looked at both options and went, do I want that one or do I want this one? <laughs> <laughs> I cheated, <What's> yeah. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, I think for the for the most part, this is the right direction, and I think it's a direction mm-hmm. they need to go to uh, because you're just not getting the same bang for your buck by trying to make the graphics look better. Hmm. Yeah, think about. Um... 
two sterling examples for me that when we say kind of immersive or just gameplay that was sort of beyond the fold and kind of meant something more. You think about, I believe it was called Journey. Mm -hmm. So it's just like mm -hmm. a, a side scroller with like no text or anything else. And ultimately, like you had to bring in somebody else to like beat some parts of it. Graphics weren't, they, they were beautiful, but it, it was a stylistic, stylistic choice as opposed to, you know, this is going to be as real as possible. Like look at the freckles, like this is amazing. Right. Instead, it was a, you know, <laughs> a beautiful art piece of a game, but then it was also fun. Like that's what kind of one of the key parts that perhaps is missing in some of this as far as narrative. Like that's cool, mm -hmm. but we, we can't necessarily lose that fun part. But the thought, the thought that even like Journey is like some, geez, it might even be 10 years old. Now. Like that's that an old one. And mm -hmm. even then, like they started to kind of like push on those edges of what could this experience be if it was like just slightly different. Right. And then the second one I always think about is uh, Near Atomica, mm -hmm. which you know, mm -hmm. ends up being a spoiler, but I think it's been out enough. So if you haven't played it yet mute i suppose <laughs> but like as best i bet promise to like i'm describing it from like what others have said i've never beat it so you guys hold me to account if i'm way off oh i haven't beat it either it's still on the to-do list <laughs> oh, well, shit, and i don't feel like i should talk about it <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a, I mean, I, a big moment at the end do you I, know what I, happens yes i do know what happens because okay. like you said it i don't know i think it's a is it 10 years old, eight years old i don't yeah, know how okay. old again it is as long as you know what happens okay that's what bad. happens so you get to the end and the only way you can beat the end boss, all of a sudden, like all these other people show up out of nowhere, you're going to die. But then hundreds of people show up and they help you beat the boss. You then get given the option, hey, what happened to you, you can do to somebody else. But to do so, you have to sacrifice your save file. You will lose all the progress that you just made, but you're going to be able to help someone like they just helped you. Do you want to play again or do you want to sacrifice everything? And just, and just like, like. Bam! Like it just and right. immediately, like that just transcends the pixels and all the bleep bloop of like the video games that we've been doing in such a cool, fascinating way. That's going to make you think. But that's on top. The coolest part with that that's on top of a game that looks great. It's mm -hmm. also fun. Like that was a fun people like playing that game. So I, when I hear this type of stuff, I tend to agree as well. Where it's just like, yeah, I, I think we've now re reached a maturity of it that people know the space, they know how to make games, like right. it becomes easier and easier. We're going to get to some more interesting stuff. Yeah. No, I really like those two examples of games you brought up because they're examples of how to create connection and community in a game mm. that's still, you know, largely a single player experience. And we kind of live in a time where uh, so many games are online, but it's not most of the time positive experiences. You hear over and over about terrible toxicity in online communities mm. of all different types. So the examples that you gave are, are ways to create meaningful, connected experiences that are inherently positive. And I think we definitely could use a lot more of that. And I do agree that it does seem like for now, progress in graphics has kind of reached a plateau where everybody's saying, well, the next jump is going to be VR, but VR has kind of stalled out and nobody really seems to be able to figure out how to make it become more mainstream. So if we can't keep progressing graphics, well, then let's go back to the stories. And you know, PlayStation is desperate to recreate the hits that they had with games like Last of Us, mm. Horizon Zero Dawn, God of War. Those are, are perhaps their three biggest IPs that they still kind of hang their hat on year to year to year, but they those kind of hits are, are few and far between and you can't just create them anytime you feel like. So it is kind of nice to hope that maybe they will focus on, on doing stuff like that, that mm. uh, as a, are the kind of games that we really like. Right. But then towards the end, of course, he's trying to justify the use of AI in the game. <laughs> that I'm a little bit less like <laughs> on board with. Have you guys ever heard the mobile app uh, AI Dungeon? Mm -mm. So, so mobile app, it's exactly what it sounds like. So it's basically just running an a LLM in the background and it's kind of doing a very basic dungeon crawler for you, all text-based. So it's like you are in a room, you can go three directions, left, right, or center. You go that way. Oh, there's a witch. What do you want to do? Ex except it's trying to stay ahead of you hmm. in so much that with your oh. options with the witch, it's not so much like there's a set path. It's more that if, imagine like I said, asked one of you guys right now to be the, you know, this game master and said like, what do you want to do with the witch? Um, I want to steal her purse. No, that, that's not like a, that's not, 
<laughs> that's probably not one of a classic one of three options in a game, but for mm-hmm. because the LLM is trying to invoke some of that uh, model that it has, it's able to come up with something, and then your your game continues that way. Love it was pretty that. clunky when I first tried it, but the fact that it was there already was sort of wild to me. And, mm-hmm. and I, I don't know; it's it, it's difficult to feel. I'd, I'd be curious your thoughts on it because I. I'm excited for the potential because that means that we could live in game worlds that are just infinite and can kind of bend to our thoughts and whims and bunch of silly stuff. But then is that the death of like creators who, you know, they're going to lose out on jobs because you can just lean on AI stuff. So I don't know where you guys kind of land on the AI potential versus downsides. I think for the most part, we as a podcast probably lean towards the the downsides of AI, just because I think Mm. one of the things that we recognize is, yes, it's a useful tool, but uh, when it comes to creating narratives and meaningful stories, uh, often what we're looking at with AI is that it's utilizing from its vast uh, stores of information, kind of rehashing existing things that we've, we've, we've seen. Mm -hmm. And we're, you know, the human mind, I think, has the capacity to be a lot more creative, but that being said, something like what you described where the AI is out in front and center and you know it's a mm-hmm. part of that, I think that that becomes mm-hmm. more entertaining, right? This idea that uh, you know that it's going to throw a curveball your way and you're just trying to figure out how to, to, to keep up with it. I think <laughs> that's super cool. We, I think we all agree that AI is inevitable, in many facets of life, but certainly games. And so we just kind of hope that it will be used to enhance the experience rather than replacing and fundamentally changing the structure of games as we know it, which is, you know, going back to the game journalism thing is yet another reason why I got out of it is because Mm. almost overnight, it seemed like sites were no longer interested in human writers. They wanted you to train their AI so Mm -hmm. that they could just crank out articles as fast as they wanted without having to wait for a human to write something. Brutal. Yeah. A lot of positivity on this show. (laughs) (laughs) Nihilism, yay. (laughs) Ah, We'll call call it realism with some good ideas sprinkled in. (laughs) There you go. Realism with more steps. All right. So from Games Radar, Helldivers 2 director believes live service is a good thing for the industry, but only if games don't nickel and dime for skins after charging $70 up front. Helldivers 2 game director has said live service games need to be kind to users and not charge $70 up front before adding more microtransaction skins. Helldivers 2 game director and up until recently Arrowhead Game Studio CEO, Johan Pielstick, recently gave a talk at the Nordic Game Conference in Sweden, where he addressed the problems facing live service games. Live service is a good thing for the games industry, if done right, Pilchett said. If you want to make a live service game, you want to have monetization in the game if you think that people are buying stuff in the game. Don't charge $70 up front and then nickel and dime people for skins. It just is wrong. Be kind to users and do live service right by asking yourself what is the value for the gamers in this game and it being live service rather than what is good for the bank account. So it's preaching to the choir, it would yeah. seem like. Amen. <laughs> See, earlier tonight, Mr. Blue, because the new season of Call of Warzone dropped today, he's like, can I buy the season pass? Okay. It's a free to play game. Okay. (laughs) Buy the season pass. But it's different than when he tried to get back into Destiny, which Mm. you paid for. And then there's 72 different DLC that you have Mm. to buy. And if you don't, then huge sections of the game are locked off to you behind this paywall and it's almost not worth playing anymore. Hmm. So I I do agree. There's, There's definitely a different way to do it. The free to play model with skins and season passes makes a hell of a lot more sense than paying for a full price game and then oh here's on top of that that you have to Mm, buy that's a lot harder to swallow yeah overwatch for me always seemed that one when it it first came out i might have even bought it but i I think it was like a 60 70 dollar game Mm -hmm. but after that it was all loot boxes and gotcha and like uh, skins and everything else like Mm -hmm. that and they needed me to play (laughs) They need me to be on so I could be fodder for other people because I was terrible at it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you would almost think they're so it's a, this weird, perverse, 
incentive for them where it's like, okay, we want you to pay, but, but I need you to be on this all the time. So they're putting up barriers for me to do the thing that they wanted to do. It felt, yeah. like a, it felt very perverse. And then by, by contrast, and this is, I don't want to call this necessarily controversial, but it's just that Fortnite tends to get um, shit on a bunch mm-hmm. ultimately, right? Mm-hmm. But, but I will contend that it's probably one of the great, if not the greatest live service game that exists. Like I have mm-hmm. friends who play it religiously and they love that game. They're in it. They have a fa- fantastic time and they're going. And the, thing, and the reason why I say this is because it makes silly amounts of money absurd amounts of money, right? Like it's the biggest title, but mm-hmm. they don't stop. Like they haven't rested because what, what you saw was, okay, uh, everybody loves this game and they'll come back and they're addicted. They, they won't stop. Right. Let's blow up the world and completely remake it based on a season thing, which is still all free, by the way. And then we're going to have Ariana Grande come in <laughs> and we're going to make her 300 feet tall. And we're going to have a live <laughs> concert. And everybody can just go and like blow up the world together. With, okay, now it's we're going to go back to the original and just they just can they do not stop or rest on their laurels. What they're doing is they're using it as a platform for kind of creative expression. Right. Like, there's just this core game loop where it's free. You can get in. Uh, it's a satisfying type of game. They listen to the community, for instance, where they got rid of build mode, one of the core tenets of it. it's like building sucks. It's hard for people who aren't hardcore. Okay, here here's a mode. There's no building. Have fun. And it's just that responsiveness to it and everything about the monetization is purely cosmetic. There's mm-hmm. nothing mm-hmm. you can buy that just makes you win. So again, people love to poo-poo on like Fortnite, but I might contend much like the CEO here's contention is that if done right, it can be kind of good for gaming. Yeah, I'm, that's fair. I mean, I think it's funny. We were just talking about AI and then you're describing 300 foot tall Ariana Grande and then we blew up the world. That sounds like something AI would come up with. <laughs> okay. yeah, here we are. So, so who, knows, who knows who's been running Fortnite this entire time? But uh, I will definitely agree. I think Fortnite is the model that has A, done it right because mm. you can be successful at this game as I understand it because I don't play. But you can be su- just as successful at the game without having spent a dime for the last 10, 15 years. Hmm. And then yet, though, it's kind of in a, in a way responsible for creating this live service monster because everybody wants yeah. to be Fortnite. They want to make Fortnite money, but they can't seem to do it. So they have to find all these shortcuts to like Fortnite success because we charge full price for the games. And then there are season passes that we charge for. They're not free. We charge for them. And then all the skins and the weapons. And here's hmm. the, what is it? The $500 bundle in... What whatever game was released or announced earlier today, and uh, now I don't remember, but I'm going to look it up real fast. But the point remains yeah, yeah. is that everybody's trying to do what Fortnite does, but without doing what Fortnite does. Well, it's your point. I League think of one Legends. of the problems. There it is. League of Legends. Five hundred dollars, real fans. Yeah. I rate over five hundred dollar bundle celebrating its greatest player, Faker. <laughs> Celebrate by giving us money. Hooray! Five hundred freaking dollars. That's like two Legend of Zelda Lego sets. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag priorities. Mm. There it is. I will say, though, that it, it would be difficult to re or to recapture what Fortnite did uh, from the start and create mm-hmm. a world like that because they, they were kind of a, an underground hit, right? At first, it was they did beta testing for it and there was some hype around that, but it, no one was expecting Fortnite to be what it is today. And if you want to make a AAA, uh, you know, live service game today, you have to essentially create a game that costs a lot of money in order to entice people to play it. You have to, it has to be the Fortnite killer, right? Mm. And Fortnite was an evolution over time, right? It started out pretty simplistic and then they built on it and built on it and built on it. So they could just take the money that they were earning and invest it into something new, right? And by having that evolution of that style of game, it, it made it so that they could accomplish what they're doing without having to charge people up front a lot mm. of money. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know if you can do that, if you can just jump into a marketplace like that and have investors and stakeholders who are expecting you to turn a profit by just saying, hey, this is free and all you got to do is just pay for skins. Hmm. Uh, You can't really recuperate at that cost. 
So I think it, I think it can be done, but it really comes down to motivation. I don't. So the the organic growth of it, I think that's a fantastic point. Like that that mm. really was something special that just kind of came out of nowhere. They didn't intend. Okay, here's what's going to happen. Right. I would say Justice League or Suicide Squad killed the Justice League was very much like, okay, we're going to do a Fortnite and get a lot of money. Like, woo. Like, that. <laughs> <laughs> like, for, like literally, I think like the first, the name of the game was probably second after the first bullet point was just like, make some money. It's like, okay, what's going to be called? <laughs> ah, Suicide Squad, I guess. Like, let's go. Right. So that's a perfect example of how it doesn't work. Like from the CEO though, Helldivers 2, like that's a $35 game. Mm -hmm. And it has the monetization, all the same kind of monetization traps, but the game itself was just big, dumb, fun, focused, like very, like, uh, very, I don't, you don't necessarily call it small because it's galactic, but the, the core loop is like relatively like, um, right. straightforward. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, only, but again, like it's almost like that smaller studio whose first point wasn't to make money to capture the Fortnite, a piece of the Fortnite pie. And instead it was like, Hey, let's create something really fun and awesome. People will like, uh, how are we going to pay for it? Well, we'll make it cheap, well, typically 35 bucks, and then we'll add these like skins a la Fortnite and do some season yeah. stuff. And, and that feels like a sprinkling of it where it's like it can be done right. Yeah, no, your point is well made because it's the microtransactions and the monetization are built around the game versus right. the game existing just mm. to prop up the monetization, which nice. is how like Suicide Squad tried to do it. And a lot of live service games where they're like, we're going to be Fortnite on day one. And the the live service market is saturated right now. Mm -hmm. So you can't. Yeah, I'm I'm fascinated to see the new so Marvel has a new one coming out. So it's Marvel's versions of Overwatch. Right. Mm -hmm. And it li like literally it's just over it looks like Overwatch but with like Iron Man instead. Totally and different. Don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Which is if it's fun, cool. I'm but I'm really curious to see like who did you learn from? Did you learn from Helldivers 2 or did you learn from Justice League? Like what <laughs> killed the Justice League? Like which which two veins are you going to? Because it'll be pretty um, indicative of how this is going to perform. Right. Hybrid Divide says Fortnite in early development was completely different game based around mm. kids building forts, defending from zombies and such. The original concept looked cool as mm. Yeah. <laughs> It's, I don't know if they ever released it. I think they kept promising they would. I don't know if they ever did. did they, they should make release? it a game mode. I thought they were supposed to, but I think yeah. they might have like gave up. I'm not sure, though. Um, I don't know that personally. I know my yeah. nephew talks about it all the time. <laughs> he would know, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Report back. Oh, we'll do. <laughs> Let's do my own research. <laughs> All right, so why don't we jump into our top three new releases for the week. Uh, starting off, number one is Aster Blade of Monolith on PS5, Xbox Series X and S, PS4, Xbox One, Switch, and PC. Rip through hordes of enemies with fury and style in this fast place action RPG. Play as Aster, a young warrior determined to unveil the secrets behind his creator's unforeseen demise. Wield an arsenal of runic weapons to hunt down the evil haunting planet Jalice and save it from impending doom. Next up is F124, PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X and S, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, PC. Join the grid and be one of the one of the 20. Drive like the greatest in EA Sports F124, the official video game of the 2024 F1 or FIA Formula 1 World Championship. That's a mouthful. And lastly is Multiversus, uh, PS5, Xbox Series X and S, PS4, Xbox One, and PC. Multiversus is back and better than ever. Multiversus is a free-to-play platform fighter that brings the depths of iconic Warner Brothers stars to life across the nearly endless possibilities of play. So taking a look at these three, Blue, what are you in for this week? So F124, I think we talk about this game every year when it comes out. <laughs> and every year we go, mm, no, I'm good. I like racing games, but I I don't care that much about F1 to where I feel like I would need to buy a whole game for it. A whole game by EA. So mm. undoubtedly it's $70 plus microtransactions because mm -hmm. EA got the EA. Yay. 
Uh, Multiversus, I am not really into platform brawlers, and this one specifically being WB stars seems like an odd... Like, I, I like Bugs Bunny, but do I want to beat up Superman with him? <laughs> not really. But this is the relaunch of the game, and apparently it already had cracked six figures on Steam, so good for them. If you want to play this, it seems like you'll have no problem finding matches so that's a good thing mm -hmm. Astor Blade of the Monolith though looks like my choice for the week it looks like uh so there was a little indie game it was called like Unbound or something where there was this little figure in a cloak and that was a side-scrolling platformer Astor Blade of the Mo Monolith looks like if that was action RPG with some light 3D platforming hopefully it's super light because I suck at 3D platforming <laughs> <laughs> um but I, in general, love those kind of games. So of these three games, that's the one I would go with. Fine choice. So I think I'd mimic a lot of that. So the with F1, it was funny because I tried loved Horizon or Forza Horizon. Mm -hmm. But it, it's like, oh, maybe I should just try, you know, Forza directly. And that, mm -hmm. that's just not the same. Okay, like, it's so <laughs> tactical. Like, I could not get to a lap. My car was just flying all over the place. <laughs> right. The, Horizon, Forza Horizon did a terrible job of preparing me. So anything that tends to <laughs> lean a bit more that much into simulator is kind of, mm -hmm. I'm more looking to have a good time. Aster looks gorgeous. Like I think that looks like a really beautiful kind of platformer. And I will say this, so Multiverse specifically, the thing I want to talk about was my kids are super into it. Like they, or they want mm -hmm. to be super into it because they like the character. They like, they're big fans of Smash Brothers. Hey, cool. Mm -hmm. It's like another Smash Brothers. Great. Except I get to be Superman or I get to be Iron Giant. So they can recognize the characters. So they have that immediate draw and they've mm -hmm. done some big fun things for that platform. Cool. <laughs> they have no bots. None. They have no bots. So you can do local versus at least. Mm -hmm. But ultimately the kid's like, hey, let's be on a team and we'll beat up uh, the computer components, right. opponents. And that just doesn't exist. You have to go online. That's a strange Ooh. choice. Yeah. It's a wild choice because it's just, it, even if the bots aren't great, the whole point is just to like learn a character and jump yeah, around okay. and like, you know, right. beat them up. But they very, very, very specifically will not let that happen. I think kind of to our earlier conversation is they're trying to push people online. It's like, no, no, no. If the two of you locally want to team up, you have to go against other people. Yeah. You're, you can't just like stay offline. That makes it so much more or so much less accessible for kids though. Oh yeah, oh, for yeah. sure. thousand percent. It's like, I don't need some, you know, 35 year old Twitch pro beating the snot <laughs> out of my child <laughs> who just wants to play, who just wants to like fly around as Superman for an afternoon. So right, right. I, yeah. I, I hope if they patch that in, that I think it'll be a big player in our household. But until then. Hmm. Okay. What about you, Ryan? Uh, so, yeah, same as sentiment for F124. In fact, uh, I don't even think I've ever seen a Formula One race officially. Like NASCAR, <laughs> I've seen indie stuff. I've seen uh, mm -hmm. Formula One has always been kind of in the, the periphery uh, when it comes to racing. So, yeah, no interest in that whatsoever. Uh, Multiverse is, looks – it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a Smash Brothers clone, right? And – I'm not a huge fan of Smash Brothers to begin with. I, I'm terrible at that game. And kind of to the same thing that you were saying here, Trevor, I feel like every time I try to play that game online, people are merciless. <laughs> and I just feel worse and worse about myself every time I play Smash you Brothers. Think so I because avoid it's, it. You think because it's not Tekken that it's going to be a nicer experience? It's going to be, you know, it's, Yeah, it's got Mario and Ness, you know? Like, these, these are no, nice characters. If they could do a fatality on you, they would. <laughs> oh yeah, rip your spine out immediately. Yep. <laughs> and as far as Aster Blade uh, or Aster Blade of the Monolith, that looks to me like what every game on the N sixty four wanted to be. Right? It's nice. this nice like three D world where uh, this time around they're actually round, you know, <laughs> rather than being not... polygons. It, and... The N sixty four tried so hard. Well, it oh. did, you know, and. and, and Again, technology at the time, but that's mm -hmm. what I think they were going for is what Aster looks like, more or less. And they were in their head, they were going to say, this is going to look awesome. And then they went, oh, crap, we got to work with blocks the entire time. Yeah. But um, it looks super fun. And it is, um, I'm not always into action RPGs. It, it really depends. I think that third person perspective is probably what I would prefer in an action RPG. Uh, so I'm... I'm actually interested in potentially checking this one out. Uh, and 
it's available on Switch as well, which is great. Doesn't mean uh, it means I don't have to go out and buy something extra in order to get it. So Aster is probably probably going to be the one I would go for. Before we move on, let's take a quick break to talk about our sponsor. This segment is proudly sponsored by A Gamer Looks at 40 podcast. The show explores the history of video games through the stories and experiences of the people who lived it. On this week's episode, Bill and his guests discuss Final Fantasy Mystic Quest. Is this RPG for babies a misunderstood relic or worth avoiding like the plague? Find out on this new episode. So this week's question is, right now, you can find Mystic Quest complete in box for $125 on eBay. What gaming thing have you spent a silly amount of money on, even though you knew it was bad to begin with? Let Bill know your answer by sending him a tweet at GamerLicks at 40 on Twitter. So what have you guys spent a silly amount of money on for a bad game? <laughs> uh it- I'm not going to say a bad game. I'm going to say a bad console. Ooh. And this is a recent purchase. Oh, but. <laughs> and this was this afternoon. <laughs> no, it was, it was about two weeks ago. I picked up an Atari 5200 because reasons. I don't know. Mm. I looked at it. I was like, I've never had one of these things. And uh, honestly, it, I bought it. It came with three games. But all three of those games are on the Atari 2600, and I guarantee you they're perfectly fine. They didn't need to be ported to a new system. Uh, the 5200 <laughs> is such a strange an- anomaly. Uh, the controllers are always bad on them, and it just doesn't work. And I, but there was, there's just this feeling that I needed it. You know, it was in front of me. <laughs> I haven't seen one for a while, so I was like, it's coming home with me. So, yeah. Okay. What about you, Trevor? So it's a, I'll, I'll give you one where I, my mom saved me. Okay. How's, that for, how's that for a starting line? So they, <laughs> so I had like money that had been saved up from a paper route and I had money burning in my hand. Mm-hmm. I had a PlayStation at home and I was looking to something to buy. And then the walls were closing. We had to leave. Like, you know, dad's getting upset. We got to get out of this mall. We got to mm. go. Gotta dad's go. upset. Like He's some. had enough mall. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Tale as old as time. Yep. And I, I'm scanning it and there's Area 51. It's like Area 50 with the old arcade shooter, but now oh, yeah. on PlayStation 1. And it, what could mm. probably be a dis- terrible, disgusting port. And at that time, probably th- this is like during P1, PS1 era, that was like $90. Wow. For that Jeez. It d- didn't even have a plastic gun. It's just $90 for this game. <sighs> and you're going to like in the panic, it. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it's like, oh, this will be fine. Like, yeah, I'll get this one. <laughs> My mom is like, $90. <laughs> <laughs> she knows nothing about games. But even she was like, that's stupid. You're not spending your money on that. Get something else. So mom swooped in with the save after I like panic almost chose Area 51 for the PS1. And thankfully picked up some other rando game that I can't recall. But thanks, mom. Great, great investment. <laughs> thanks, mom. <laughs> so I really couldn't think of something that I've spent a silly amount of money on for something that I knew was bad. I mean, if it's bad, I don't really want to buy it. The best thing that I could come up with is that I got Mr. Blue a complete inbox copy of Milan's Secret Castle. Oh, yes. (laughs) But that was only $45. I don't know if that's overpriced for that game, but Uh, that's that's not, I wouldn't really consider that like a silly amount of money. Uh, I also bought E.T., (laughs) <laughs> for yeah. the 2600 that was all of a whopping five dollars wow. so but the label is perfect that's like chef's kiss yep. right? yeah that's like that's the greatest purchase ever you get to say that you purchased that it's perfect mm-hmm. five whole dollars <laughs> and then it, it completes my howard's got warshaw collection <laughs> for <laughs> indiana jones yard's revenge and et so priceless priceless the perfect choice <laughs> <laughs> I feel like what you have to do is you have to put Yara's Revenge on the outside, Indiana Jones in the middle, and then, it, you know, it's got to be a descending order from good to bad, right? <laughs> That's how they should be Yara, arranged on the shelf. Right. Yara <laughs> should never touch E.T. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> but E.T. You, needs the help. <laughs> I can give you one more. Unfortunately, it's not gaming related, but it's definitely way too much money. So, the, um, so I'm Canadian. I don't know if you noticed from the accent. Wait, can you guys, so by the way, can you hear, do I have a Canadian accent? Mm-hmm. 
Damn Only it. in certain words. <laughs> Only in certain words. <laughs> Your paper route was the most recent. <sighs> God damn. Because because I'll be called. <laughs> I get called out on it all the time, and I can't hear it. But so that goes. All right. Anyways, I'm Canadian. We have a coffee chain called Tim Hortons. It's like Dunkin'. It's like our Dunkin' Donuts, except it's much beloved and you know. Part mm-hmm. of our heritage, basically, because we, <laughs> we lack culture. Go I head guess. down there and get a double double. There, it's man. See, so you, you know the lingo. You know the lingo, so it's good. <laughs> At one point, they had sold mugs that just like ceramic mugs that look like they're cups mm-hmm. from it, and I bought one. It was one of my favorite mugs. And then, on one of our moves, my wife unfortunately dropped and broke it, <laughs> smashed it. I was, I was so upset. I couldn't believe it. It was. I was so unforgivable. Sad. So, so I, for the longest time, I tried to hold off. It's like I just, I just want that mug because <laughs> they, they stopped selling it, and they had stopped selling it for ten years, and I could not. It was a brain worm. So off to eBay, and I think I ended up paying forty dollars for another like replica for this like ten dollar Tim Hortons mug, which is just a replica of their paper cup. <laughs> because I, I just, I just couldn't get it off my brain. It's like I liked it; it was fun at the time, and now it's gone. I just want it back. And then that got stolen by tenants. So it was just like, oh, <laughs> so God. So I'm still just <laughs> mugless. But I don't, so I spent way too. And I, honestly, I'd probably buy it again. There's just something about having it in my house. So too much money. But you know what? What's the point of being an adult with a job if you can't spend your hard earned money on stupid sh- you don't need, but that makes you happy? They get to look at and smile every time. Right. 100% agree. AKA $300 Deku tree Lego <laughs> sets. <laughs> Link, listen. <laughs> well, that piece, I'm sure everybody's just going to throw in the trash. <laughs> and we've been fighting all these nobbies. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for coming, students. Please take your seats and welcome back to Professor Rybrad's Gaming History 101. And in today's lesson, we'll be talking about a game that celebrates its 25th birthday today. And it's a game that will live in infamy to many lovers of the N64. From bad level design to awful controls, it has been widely panned as being one of the worst games of all time. We, of course, are talking about Ocarina of, just kidding, Superman, (laughs) the new Superman (laughs) Adventures, best known as Superman 64. Oh, I didn't know it was such a prestigious anniversary today. (laughs) Notice how nobody on Twitter talked about it. No, I, you know, I did notice that. Normally, Twitter is all over those kinds of anniversaries. This one was kind of crickets, Absolutely. though. Mm-hmm. Has it has it broken through now where that game's actually worth a lot of money? Because just no. how bad it is? No, still? That's, <laughs> still, wow, that's a real yeah. stank on it. That's right, crazy. That, that's like E.T. right there. It's right up in that echelon. It's going for pretty cheap. <laughs> My $5 copy is going to be like $20. 30 years from now. You have no idea. Yeah, but that's only because of inflation. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. Don't kill my dreams. It's relative to. Don't worry. You can bequeath it to somebody. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> what if I want to betroth it to somebody? Ooh, touche. <laughs> that kind of hurt me. I got to be honest. <laughs> so before we get a chance to talk about the game, I think it's important to understand where the concept of this loathed addition to the N64 library came from. Now, I want to take you back to the early 1990s. Comic books are making a comeback in a big way from their success in the 50s and the 70s. And just like we saw with those eras, characters are depicted in these comic book universes can be found in many other places than the pulpy pages of a comic book. So movies and TVs were capitalizing on the comic book hero craze. From live action movies in the 80s with both Superman and Batman absolutely crushing the box box office to X-Men, the animated series, capturing the minds of young viewers on their television sets. And I apologize that this is awful, but I'm the juggernaut, bit. Hmm. You're welcome. (laughs) I know it's going to be the ending sound this episode. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So naturally, (laughs) a Superman cartoon was inevitable and Superman, the animated series, first aired on Kids WB in September of 1996. And the show was a smash hit with its mixture of old and new lore that made the series stand out as something that all comic book fans could enjoy. And it had a great voice acting crew that was highlighted, in my opinion, 
by the voice work of Clancy Brown playing Lex Luthor. You may know him as the voice of Mr. Krabs from SpongeBob or that jerk Ooh. head guard in Shawshank Redemption. So with the development of the game, it actually started even before the show aired. Eric Kahn, one of the founders of the French game developer Titus, heard from the Los Angeles office that the series was being made, and Eric knew that he had to have the rights from Warner Brothers. Now, aggressively going after the license to the point that even executives at Warner Brothers asked Eric on three separate occasions if he knew what he was doing. <laughs> Securing the license in 1997, he planned to produce the games for both Game Boy, PlayStation 1, and N64. And the one success story out of this endeavor was that the Game Boy game was released in late 1994 with a mediocre reception. And it was a pretty simple game consisting of playing Superman through 10 different levels, beating the baddies. Now, for the N64 and PlayStation versions of the game, they wanted to copy the concept of Tomb Raider, a more of an open world game with real time strategy elements. So the idea was to give the players latitude to play the game however they wished, taking on the criminals of Metropolis. Now, sadly, limitations of the storage capabilities of the N64, being a cartridge based system with about 64 megabytes of space, made it impossible to, to achieve this plan. In fact, it is said that less than 10% of the original ideas for the game made their way into the final product. Now, the development was also marred with issues with Warner Brothers themselves. Apparently, the licensing team changed within a week of signing the deal, and they hated Titus so much they worked to try to get the game canceled. In fact, the new team <laughs> at Warner Brothers wanted this to be a Sim City like game where Superman would play the mayor. That is so lame. That's gross. It's <laughs> almost worse. <laughs> right. Now, the next major change came from when Warner Brothers wanted to make sure that Superman wasn't hurting and I'll quote, real people in the game. Therefore, Titus made the setting of the game in a virtual reality world created by Lex Luthor. And Warner Brothers continued to have such a stranglehold over Titus that it took them months to even get a single character approved. Now, these delays meant that fixing issues with the hit detection and the controls was truncated to the point where they had to release the game knowing that it was faulty. Even the dreaded rings level were originally supposed to be only a tutorial, but were added in places when they ran out of time. Now, the Superman or Superman 64 is an example of a game that today would have never been as successful as it ended up being. Because of the name recognition and the hype over the show, players rushed out to buy the game in droves. Had this been today, word would have gotten out quickly about how flawed this game was and sales would have plummeted. Delays in journalists getting access to the game and the time it took for to put their reviews in print allowed the game to sell over 500,000 copies. Right. <laughs> so, so the game would... All right. <laughs> now, the game would eventually be torn to shreds by print media, and EGM gave the, the game a score of 8 out of 40. Game Informer wow. ranked it a 1.2 out of 10, and even N64 Magazine rated it a 14% out of 100. Now, Superman 64 would have likely been a game lost to obscurity, but with the advent of YouTube, it got new life as one of the worst games ever made. Now, today it's often used as a mean to describe something that is considered universally bad. I think you'd be hard-pressed to find a post on Twitter where someone doesn't answer Superman 64, ironically, under the title, what is your favorite N64 game? So to wrap things up, Superman 64 is a very flawed game. But considering the development and poor relationship with Warner Brothers, can we really blame Titus for its failure? I'll leave that question up to you, the listeners. So thank you for attending today's Gaming History 101. And just a reminder, if you have ideas for a story you'd like or a topic you'd like to hear, send us a message at gamersweekpodcast at gmail.com. We might feature your suggestion. Webhead in the chat says the one good thing about Superman 64 is it eventually gave us the GameCube Superman game, which is what the 64 version was supposed to be. Right. Oh. And in fact, uh, they had the reception was so bad for the N64 game that they completely scrapped the PlayStation game, the PS1 wow. version that they were going to come out with. Yeah. I man, I had no clue. I feel so bad for Titus. Because <laughs> <laughs> initially you look at that and it's like, oh, this is gross this is a classic 
shelfware, like, okay, just get some developers to put together something and slap a Superman on it. But instead, it sounded like this guy, you know, I, I can't vouch for what it would have been. Mm-hmm. But at the very mm-hmm. least, it sounded like he had a vision, and then it just got completely crushed. <laughs> it's like forces. It's like, like the virtual, like the rings thing. Like that's a fascinating like tidbit. Like it, if anything, yeah, it made me sad. If anything, it's like ah, oh. <laughs> it's like what could have been if just like left alone to like uh, truly give the Superman game he wanted to build. Mm-hmm. And it just reminds me of the the development as well with ET and uh, Howard Scott Warshak goes to show Steven Spielberg the game he's been working on and describe it to him and basically say, this is what I want to do. And Spielberg's response is, well, couldn't you just make it like Pac-Man? And that just reminded me of that moment where, couldn't you just make this like SimCity where Superman's oh the God. mayor? <laughs> my, my daughter really likes SimCity. Could you just make that? <laughs> Any suggestion that is preceded by couldn't you just oh my God. is a bad suggestion. Right, right. <laughs> All right, thank you for listening to this episode, number 119 of Gamers Week Podcast. And a big thank you to Retro Game Club Podcast, Love Retro BTW, and A Gamer Looks at 40 Podcast for sponsoring this episode. Don't forget to check out their links in the show notes. If you want to connect with Gamers Week, follow us on Twitter at Gamers Week PC. Watch us right here on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Gamers Week Podcast, where we will record live every Wednesday at 8.30 Central Time. Email us at gamersweekpodcast at gmail.com. Visit our merch store at gamers-week-podcast.creator-spring.com. Or if you want to do it the easy way, follow the link in the show notes. And last but not least, join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gamersweek. Finally, since you made it all the way to the end of the episode, please leave us a rating and review to let us know how we did. We really do value your feedback. And while you're there, consider subscribing to iTunes, Spotify, or your podcast platform of choice. And Trevor, thank you so much for coming on tonight's episode. Really, really appreciate it, man. Uh, Absolute pleasure. Absolute joy. Thanks so much for having me on here. It's got to talk about Legend of Zelda, some Superman, and AI in the future, everything else in between. So, (laughs) absolute blast. Thanks, guys. So, everybody needs to check out New Dad Gaming now that you're done with this episode. Trevor, where can everybody find your show? Yeah, absolutely. So find us on social at New Dad Gaming and from our website, newdadgaming.com. Awesome. Be sure to uh, tell people all about it. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. oh, it just cuts to the core. I can't <laughs> <call it. laughs> I'm, so, I'm so conscious. I ask everybody now because it's, it's like, no, I'm, I can I can just walk among them. They'll have no idea. It's like, <laughs> ah, what part of Canada are you from, you hoser? <laughs> That's okay, myself, at least you're Canadian, so you're too nice to be mad at us about it. <laughs> <laughs> Wear it as a badge on, I suppose. Well, <laughs> Absolutely. Sorry about that. (laughs) 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 All right. Well, good night, everybody. Uh, Good night, guys. I'm the juggernaut, bit. Welcome to Gamers Week Uncut. Welcome to Gamers Week Uncut. Welcome to Gamers Week Uncut, patrons with benefits. This is the unscripted patron-only bonus cast with less editing and more dirty jokes. We don't know where the conversation will go, but we're sure it will be weird. This fish just went right on my nipple. And I'm just like... <laughs> <laughs> I Google Street Fighter 6, the first search result that comes up is people think they can see Ryu's dick in the Street Fighter 6 reveal. <laughs> Listen up here, kids. You're not going to want to get one of those VDSTDs things, right? Make your dick fall off. When you go, grab a pro. You'll be doing it for America. That was perfect. <laughs> If you want to hear weekly episodes of our patron-only bonus cast, join us at patreon.com slash gamersweek.